and talk about APRV, which is uh, always a black box of ventilation, I think, for most people. So, um, so our objectives will, will review ventilator-associated lung injury because I think it's really important to know uh, how lung injury occurs as a result of the ventilator, um, and that helps the understanding of the APRV mode a lot. Um, we'll discuss the basics of lung protective strategies to help prevent lung injury. We'll, in, we'll introduce the topic of APRV, and then we'll examine all the data and uh, you know how to how to manage a patient with it. So we'll start first start talk start talking about ventilator associated lung injury. So uh, it's important to know that the early stage of ARDS have regions of dependent alveolar collapse, uh, and treatment of the collapse is uh, lung reinflation or recruitment. The percentage of recruitable lung could range from either really small numbers to even greater than 50 percent based on how well you do your recruitment maneuvers. Uh, APRV is a mode of ventilation that may be useful in situations uh, in which lungs need to be recruited. And it was initially developed as a lung protective mode which allowed the recruitment while minimizing the ventilator associated lung injury in a very specific way. So, we can't talk about ventilator associated lung injury without looking at this graph. Uh, so if you look at the graph, uh, on the pressure is on the, uh, har the horizontal axis and lung volume is on the vertical axis, uh, axis. And this is called the compliance curve. And the curve, if you notice, just like any other sigmoid curve, has two inflection points. There's a lower inflection point, an upper inflection point, and between those two points is where the curve is the steepest. Um, this is where you have lung compliance and elasticity that is the greatest. If you look below the lower inflection point, you might have alveolar collapse. And if you look above the upper inflection point, you might have over distension of lungs where the lungs lose its elastic properties and the alveoli become over distended. And the whole idea of safe ventilation is to ventilate pe people below the lower upper inflection point and above the lower inflection point. So anytime that you're ventilating someone, no matter what mode you're using, the whole idea is to be below the upper and above the lower. You ventilate people between these two points. <coughs> it's when you violate <coughs> these points is when you can cause patient harm. So if you violate... If you violate the lower inflection point, that's called alveolar rapid expansion and collapse injury. And if you violate the upper inflection point, that's called barotrauma or volutrauma. One of the two. Um, and so the safe way of ventilating people is between those two points. And if you look, the pressure is somewhere um, here, somewhere between physiologic peak, which is somewhere between 5 and 10. And the upper inflection point is somewhere about 30 centimeters of water pressure. So that's the classic teaching of you don't want your peak inspiratory pressure to be above 30 millimeters of water pressure because then you're going to violate the upper inflection point. And that's why you don't ventilate anyone at a peak that's less than 5 and even sometimes 8 so you don't violate the lower inflection point. And then when you give a tidal volume, you stay between these two points. So lung protective strategies, uh, let's see. Uh, so you avoid lung collapse by using PEEP as we said before. Uh, during mechanical ventilation, the pressure on alveoli is lowest at the end of expiration and are most prone to collapse. Uh, the cycle of opening and closing damage, damages the alveolus and it causes atelectic trauma or cyclical atelectasis or rapid expansion, alveolar collapse and expansion race. Uh, the solution is application of positive and expiratory pressure, which is PEEP, uh, which is you know standard in most ICUs is, is 5, but certainly we're starting at 8 here, and it could be even higher depending on if you look at someone's physiologic PEEP. No Why do we um, change it, just curious, to 8? No, are we doing that now? Is there we'll a study? That after oh, yes, at the end. Okay. Yeah, well, I'm not, it's not at the end, but that's to, that has to do with uh, ventilator associated events, oh, Medicare, so okay, and okay, CDC. Okay. That okay. has nothing to do with this. Okay. Um, so there was a paper that came out years ago uh, in 2006, uh, which uh, kind of confirmed all this. Uh, so uh, the authors compared outcomes in an intervention group that received a peak level of 2 centimeters of water pressure above the lower inflection point and, and low tidal volumes, and in a control group that received a higher tidal volumes and a peak of 5 centimeters of water pressure. The study stopped early after significant higher mortality in control group than the intervention group, 53% versus, versus 
so in the in the uh, in the control group, you can see the control group was the peep of five, and the intervention group was two above five. <coughs> so this group did this, this group did better. So avoiding over distension with lower tidal volumes, uh, tidal volumes that exceed the upper inflection point. Uh, overstretch the lung and induce volutrauma or barotrauma. And this can manifest as a pneumothorax or pneumothorax and air escaping the lung. So remember, you want to be above the lower inflection point, which shows less indices of race injury, and below the upper inflection point, which shows less barotrauma. So the ARDS network is a multi-center randomized control trial that showed lower mortality in patients receiving mechanical ventilation with lower tidal volumes than with higher conventional tidal volumes. This, this trial was in uh, 2000. Uh, it's kind of a landmark paper that everyone seems to quote. Um, uh, they were randomized, so it's basically half the ICU was randomized to a, to a tidal volume of 12 cc's per kilo, and half of the ICU was randomized <coughs> to a tidal volume of 6 cc's per kilo. And you can see here that um, mortality rates significantly were lower in the lower tidal volume group than with the conventional tidal volume group, and it's, it's 31 to 40 percent. So while it doesn't seem that high, it was, it was statistically significant. Um, it's a very strange trial, and I, I say this a lot on rounds, and I tell the nurses a lot, and then some of my partners look at me and say, don't say that, uh, because it was a rather unethical trial, and I'll just tell you, I'll, I'll explain it in one second here. So if I take half the ICU, regardless of the way I'm ventilating them now, and I decide, no matter what their tidal volume is, I'm going to make it 12 cc's per kilo. And I take the other half of the ICU, again, with no reference point, I'm going to take their tidal volumes and drop them to 6 cc's per kilo. So now I have two groups. I have a 12 cc per kilo group and a 6 cc per kilo group. And I'm comparing them against each other. So the, if you, you, you just see a problem with that. Everyone see a problem with that? That's called an, that's called a, an error of randomization trial. So. What, you, what they should have done is they should have compared six to a standard of care, which they can get by looking at all of their patients over the last year and seeing what their tidal volume is. And then they could have compared 12 to the same standard of care. You don't compare two study groups. Right? The first trial we talked about, they compared a control and an intervention group. This trial, they compared two study groups. Find that awkward? I find that very awkward. So there's a there's a, a, a critical care doctor at NIH that um, that actually broke this trial um, a couple of years afterwards, where he went back and looked at all the patients that were excluded from the trial, and found out that the standard of care that the excluded patients were being vented at, for whatever reason they were excluded, was about 10. So th what does that tell you? It tells you that 12 is worse than 6 but it's unclear if it's worse than 10. Whereas 6 is better than 12, but it's unclear if it's better than 10. See what I'm saying? And they never did a repeat trial to, right, to see if those were equivalent, right? Just like, just like Crestor, like one of the, new, the newer statins. Has anyone ever compared Crestor to Lipitor, which is one of the older statins? No, no drug company would ever pay for that, because they might see that their drug is not as good. So you compare drugs to placebo. Right? Drugs are always compared to placebo. They're not compared to two, to two treatment groups. And so I think that was a problem with this. And it's actually, if you just read the New England Journal carefully, or other high-impact journals, you'll see that there's a lot of these trials. And so just take it with a grain of salt. But in any event, this is a standard landmark trial. right? And it changed the way we vented patients. And so some people use the tidal volume low tidal volumes equals better outcomes. Other people say low tidal volumes equals lower peak inspiratory pressures, and it's the peak inspiratory pressures that have the better outcomes. So no matter what you use, one is a surrogate for the other. I, I more so deal with pressures. So um, based on those studies, the first study by Villar and the second study by Arsnet group, um, lower tidal volumes with appropriate levels of peak to ensure recruitment are uh, the current standards in mechanical ventilation in patients with ARDS, right? So there's, there's you want to be above the lower inflection point with a peak something, five or higher. You want to be below the upper inflection point with lower tidal volumes, which give you lower vent pressures. Make sense? 
So APRV. So APRV is airway pressure release ventilation. It was first described by Stock in 1987. It's essentially a pressure control mode with a spontaneous breathing through the entire respiratory cycle. That's what it is. It's designed to oxygenate and augment ventilation for patients with ARDS or low compliance lung disease. So APRV applies CPAP, which is basically the P high that you hear of all talk about, for a prolonged time, which is the T high, to maintain adequate lung volume and alveolar recruitment with a time cycled release uh, phase to lower pressure, which is the P low, for the shorter time, which is T low. And you can see on this curve, that's what the that's what the pressure time curve looks like on an APRV vent. Right? So you have P high for T high, and then it cycles to a P low for a T low, and then it recycles. Right? Um, APRV allows unrestricted spontaneous breathing throughout the whole cycle. That's what these are. These are pants. And so the patient can pant throughout the whole cycle, which is why it doesn't work when patients are paralyzed. Because if they don't pant, they're going to not ventilate well. So constant airway pressure facilitates recruitment, right? Because you're giving the, the majority of the respiratory cycle is at a higher pressure. And let me go back for one second. Right? So the majority of the respiratory cycle is at a P high which oftentimes, in this case, it's 30, right? And as long as you're at 30 or less, you're not violating the upper inflection point. Agree? And so if we're breathing right now, resting, my respiratory rate is probably around 12 per minute. So if you divide 12, or six, 12 into 60, 60 seconds in a minute, right? So then what's the breath to breath time? Breath to breath time is a full cycle of respiration in seconds. So it's five. Breath to breath time is five seconds. So when you set the APRV time, which we'll talk about in a little while, your breath to breath time at five seconds equates into the 4.2 second PI and the 0 0.8 second T low start. Uh, so talk about this. So constant airway pressure is recruitment. You're giving a PI for a prolonged amount of time. It enhances diffusion of gases, it prevents overextension of the alveolus because you're making sure to not violate the upper inflection point. And then it augments collateral ventilation. I think I have a picture of it. I do. So collateral ventilation is pretty important, especially when you have alveolar collapse, right? We've all heard of the pores of cone, right? So those are little little uh, connections between the, the distal alveolus. Right? But there's also other ways. So there's uh, Lembert's canals, which connect terminal and respiratory bronchioles with adjacent peribronchial or alveoli, and there's also channels of Martin that are interbronchial connections. So you can apply P high for a certain amount of time and augment flow between alveolus and ultimately connect the whole lung cell. Uh, in normal lungs, collateral ventilation probably doesn't even occur. Uh, these alternate pathways may be opened with sustained breaths to maintain constant airway pressure and allow for assistance in ventilation. So let's apply the APRV, right? So setting pressures. So P high should be below the upper inflection point, right, on a static volume pressure curve. P low should be above the lower inflection point. So you have the lower inflection point, the high inflection point, or the upper inflection point. You have P high, you have P low between those two points, and that's when you cycle the APRV. P high, right? So that's measured plateau pressure in conventional mode using accepted protective strategies. So if someone's in a volume control mode like PRVC, right? So what's the plateau pressure? Well, it's 30, 25, 26, whatever it is. You can use that as your initial P high, right? So if someone has a mean airway pressure of 25 on a conventional vent mode, you can use that as your initial P high. Or if your plateau pressure is less than 30, you can use that as your initial P high. If your plateau pressure is over 30, you can use 30 years your initial PI. And you want to minimize peak alveolar pressure, reduce one over distension, and keep it there. So usually the max is 30. Now, if someone's dying, right, who cares? If you have to go above 30, you can go above 30. Certainly 35 and 40 has been used. But in general, you want to stay below 30. And then PLO, you initially set that at 0 centimeters of low pressure. Times, T-high, that should allow complete inflation with absent flow at the end of the inspiratory phase. You start by four seconds by calculating the breath to breath time as I described before, the initial breath to breath time in most people is about five seconds. Um, 
And uh, so you calculate with four seconds from breath to breath time. T low, well, T low should allow complete exhalation with absent flow and end expiratory phase. You start at 0.6 to 0.8 seconds and adjust accordingly so that flow time curve is, so when pressure ends, expiratory flow reaches about 40% of peak inspiratory flow. And you can see that here. So this is T low. From here to here is T low. From here to here is T high. Right? P high. P high spontaneous press, all the way down, T low, right, and then T low, T low, T low, T low, and then T high, right, and you see, so this is expiration, 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 expiration. However, when you want the next T high to start, from here to here, should be about 40% of here to here. Right, 50%. So in other words, you want the next breath to start at about 50 to 40% of time it takes to exhale. And that allows controlled RP. So P high, T high, P low, and T low, right? So I think I have this as a thing here. So P high is Sorry, I thought I made a little cartoon, but I guess I didn't. So, uh, spontaneous abreasts occur during P high, mostly. Uh, T high is the blue, which is the CPAP phase. P low is uh, this point here, and T low is from here to here. So, how do you adjust it? Right, so, you have your initial starting pressures by the breath to breath time, and your initial, either your plateau mean airway pressure or your peak pressure, depending on what you choose. So what if someone's consistently hypoxic during the APRB? Because I constantly hear they failed APRB. I hear that a lot. They failed APRB. I can tell you, people don't usually fail APRB. They don't. It's that you didn't give them enough time or you didn't use it correctly. Because you can't just sit <coughs> and walk away. Right? So if someone's persistently hypoxic, um, you can increase the FiO2. Obviously, if it's not 100, make it 100. Um, you can increase the P high. So if the P high is 25, you can go up to 30. It's 30, you can go to 32, like I said before. You can increase the T high, right? So longer amounts of P high, or you can decrease the T low. Now, So if I decrease the T low, right, I make this distance shorter, what's going to happen? It's going to cause inhalation to start before exhalation finishes, right? And so if, it's, if you have this at 20% where inhalation starts, get it to 30 or 40%. So you decrease the T low and you cause less time to exhale and ultimately more time in P high. Right, and more controlled auto -pain. Right, so if someone's hypoxic, increase FiO2, increase P high, increase T high, or decrease T low. If someone's not ventilating well and they're retaining CO2 and they're becoming a little hypercapnic, which obviously is accepted, then there's ways that you can adapt that. So, have, so you can increase P high, right? Increasing P high ultimately increases your delta P. The delta P is the distance between P high and T high. Right? So any way you can increase that delta P will ventilate better. So you can increase P high, you can decrease T high, right? and give you more delta P's per time. Right? Or you can increase T low, increasing T low, right, will give you more time to fully expire and air travel less. Um, also you can try decreasing sedation, and certainly if they're paralyzed, stop it. And that will allow more spontaneous breaths to occur mostly during the high. Alright, so you're weaning it now. Right? Oftentimes I hear, oh, he did okay, I went back to PRBC. And then what happens? They de recruit. And they're on 60% of FiO2 and 20 AP. And we think that's okay. No, they de recruited them. So the way that you wean APRB is you wean it as if it was a pressure support mode. And you can wean it all the way to CPAP. 
So weaning APRV, you should do it carefully, right? Just because you're weaning, it doesn't mean they're better. Um, and you have, do it carefully because you can, you can avoid de recruitment by doing it properly. <coughs> so it's recommended by lowering P high, you know, by two to five centimeters of water pressure at a time, and lengthening T high by, by 0.5 to two seconds at a time. And that's referred to as the drop and stretch, right? So you, you're dropping the P high and stretching the T high. And you can keep going. So whether you're doing two or five, you can keep going until the T high is so long that they're basically just doing spontaneous breaths on the T, and that's basically pressure. Ideally, if you're doing it right as you're weaning, you should be weaning to see kind of pressure. Support. That's correct. And you avoid you, you avoid the uh, de recruit that occurs when taking that away and putting them on a PRVC or a volume control mode. Um, and so once the PI is about 15 centimeters of water pressure and T high is about 10 to 15 seconds, that's pressure support. So just say core pressure support. So we should always be weaning from by then to pressure support. Yeah. You shouldn't, go to, you shouldn't go to a PR, PRVC. The mode that we use here, I often refer to as vent for dummies, right? Because it it's basically, you know, you set four parameters, you call it a day. Um, it's very rare that they're gonna, they'll never auto peep on it. It does an auto flow adjustment, so they're not going to be flow starved for the most part. Um, and uh, it doesn't allow recruitment because it's a pressure regulated mode. And so, in order to allow recruitment, sometimes you have to give them a little extra pressure safely. Um, so, that's the answer. So, when you have APRV and you're doing well in it, it's time to wean. Keep weaning it until you see that pressure support. Um, so, most studies that looked at APRV show physiologic benefits and improved. Uh, clinical scenarios uh, with regarding oxygenation, use of, use of sedation, hemodynamic variables, as well as respiratory mechanics. No study ever reported that APRV decreases mortality, however, uh, as compared with conventional vent modes. So that's the conundrum that we have, is that the only thing that has showed benefit with a ARDS and mortality regarding ARDS is the ARZEN trial, which was really low tidal volumes, ultimately low peak pressures, uh, and then proning actually, there's a paper that came out in the last year, proning shows the mortality benefit. But if you think about it, if I can oxygenate someone better, are they going to live? Probably. So while there's no mortality benefit, it's just the study wasn't done correctly or not done yet. Right, because these patients are dying. I mean, we've all seen it where someone comes down from the floor after an aspiration event, or they're a trauma patient, pancreatitis, whatever they are, they're in ARDS. And I'll be here, or someone else will be here, and I know what's going on. And I'll tell RT, get the oscillator, get the nitric, and then we're going to be doing things, whether it's bilateral check, because this guy's dying like right now. And so oftentimes, you don't have time to function as if this guy is in a trial. You know what I'm saying? ARDS is either mild or moderate, and they're going to do OK, or it's severe, and they're going down the tubes fast. What if there's a kipnic on this vent? Is that such a would you have to make? Well, we oftentimes get called with that. Because so they're panting. They're yeah. panting. Yeah. They're panting. Yeah. They're not really taking full tidal bombs. Okay. And I didn't even mention that you can actually add pressure support to this. Okay. So you can add pressure support to APRV so that way when they pant in P high or T high, when they pant, so every time they trigger the vent, the vent will give them five yeah. pressure support and it'll even ventilate them a little, ventilate them a little okay. better. Okay. So, uh, Original animal studies of APRB, like I said, Stock originally described it in 1987. His uh, trial was initially in dogs. Ten dogs with and without ARDS randomized to APRB versus volume control plus B. Uh, APRB delivered adequate alveolar ventilation, had lower peak air pressures, promoted better arterial oxygenation to compare with volume control. It didn't show mortality benefit. Better oxygenation. It always, all these things always showed better oxygenation. Nitric oxide, flow land, prone, um, all the things that we do always show better oxygenation but never had a mortality benefit. Uh, Martin in 1991 uh, uh, studied seven neonatal lambs with acute lung injury. We don't use that term anymore, right? That we mild ARDS now. Uh, four ventilation modes were examined, pressure support ventilation, APRV volume controlled, and spontaneous breathing. APRV maintained oxygenation while augmenting alveolar ventilation compared to the pressure support. APRV also provided uh, ventilation at lower peak pressures in contrast to volume control. So in other words, you can oxygenate them and ventilate them at lower pressures in a more controlled fashion. Uh, APRV was effective to maintain oxygenation and assist ventilation with minimal cardiovascular import in their animal model. Uh, 
uh, human trials, Glutzin uh, randomized 30 patients with multiple trauma to either APRV or spontaneous breathing pressure support uh, N equals 15 or pressure control ventilation 15 for 72 hours APRV associated with increases in lung compliance and as well as oxygenation and reduction of shunting. Uh, APRV was associated with a shorter duration of ventilatory support in that trial as well as a shorter length of ICU stays and a shorter duration of sedation use. Um, use of basal presses, I don't know if that has anything to do with it. But shorter ICU days, shorter ventilation days, whether it doesn't statistically show increased mortality, think about it. If you're not vented and if you're not in the ICU, then your your, your VAT rates go down, your PEDVT rates go down. All the things that, right, so it, it might not show benefit with regarding ARDS, but it has to show overall benefit that wasn't looked at. Uh, Varpula and colleagues performed a prospective randomized study to determine whether response of oxygenation to prone position differed between APRV and SIMV ventilation. Now, for SIMV, think of it as a volume control ventilation. Contrast it to, to PRVC, when the patient initiates a breath, it, the patient initiates their own tidal volume, right? And the reason why it's S for synchronous is that the machine won't let the patient double stop. <coughs> so if the machine wants to give a breath and the patient wants to take a breath at the same time, it won't allow that. That's why it's synchronous. But um, you have to set a flow as opposed to uh, PRVC. What question? What's the like supporting data? Why do we always use PRVC and we never use SIMV? Because the majority of patients aren't sick enough. There are some trauma centers with shock trauma that uses APRV as their starting vet mode. So it varies. It varies based on practice patterns. It varies based on a lot of things. Um, I, why most places don't. And what about SIMV with PRVC? My residency, SIMV was the standard starting vent mode. Uh, but remember, vent modes are also designed by the ventilator manufacturer. Mm -hmm. And they're, some of them are trademarked by the ventilator manufacturer. There's a lot of vent modes that exist. A lot of vent modes. It's just that some ventilators can't use that mode because it's, it's trademarked by Purit. And Puritan can't use this vent mode because it's trademarked by, by Drager. So, so sometimes, bi level is the number, the name we use for our vents. Mm -hmm. I see it out there. Uh, I think dual pap is another. Yeah, there are tons of names. Vent, it's very, but very similar to Puritan. MMV. There's many, <laughs> many, many vent modes that we have. Mm -hmm. Some are designed. SIMV was designed by a surgeon and it was designed as an auto weaning mode, um, meaning you can just set it and assuming they're doing okay, just leave them on it. It'll wean him down once he takes enough breaths and enough tidal volumes and meets the predetermined minute ventilation that you set. It won't give many breaths at all, and it'll just let him do PS. You know, so, yep. But it takes it takes way too long, which is why people like more control. Um, but there are some centers, some heavy name trauma centers that use APRV as a starting mode. Lung contusions. I mean, I will prophylactically put them on APRV, uh, and I'm not going to wait for them to get sick. You can avoid a lot of that hyper hypercarbia with that. I think. Um, but anyway, in this trial, so 45 patients with acute lung injury randomized within 72 hours of mechanical ventilation to receive either APRV prone or SIMV prone. Um, all patients were prone for six hours once or twice a day. Oxygenation to first pronation was similar in both groups, but significant improvement occurred after the second pronation in the group with ARDS. So while there's no benefit, uh, mortality benefit, there's a clear oxygenation benefit in this trial with prone positioning on APRV versus SIMV. Uh, the same investigators in 2004 randomized 58 patients with acute lung injury to APRV or SIMV, not prone, but standard supine. Uh, and there was no significant differences in clinically important outcomes, such as ventilator-free days, sedation days, or ICU days. But what they noticed was that there was always lower ventilator pressures in APRV. So if you believe in the acute lung injury model, then that should be beneficial. Uh, DART found that retrospectively 46 trauma patients who were ventilated with APRV for 72 hours found improvements in the PF ratio, uh, which is ultimately hypoxia, uh, as well as a decrease in peak airway pressures after starting APRV. Conclusions, right? So we reviewed ventilator-associated lung injury. We talked about some basic mechanisms of how the lung is injured. We discussed the basis of lung protective strategies and how to keep people out of danger with the ventilator. We introduced APRV. We talked about the basic modes the rationale for using them, how to start them, as well as how to adjust them based on hypoxia, hypercarbia, and so forth. And then we looked at some data to show that while there's no mortality benefit, it's clearly oxygenation. <coughs> a few clinicians believe that any single treatment can be responsible for major outcome.
using it, but some people will say put them on the ARDSNET protocol. That's what we described before based on the ARDSNET trial. So the, the, the tidal volume goes down to 60 meters per kilo or less. And then PEEP and FIO2 are adjusted to maintain oxygenation. That's what it is. It's the weaning that I have a problem with, right? So we didn't talk about lung injury due to high FIO2, but oxygen toxicity and lung injury as a result of high oxygen tensions is real and it can happen. And it that might even be ultimately how people will succumb to ARDS when they're being oxygen 100% FIO2 for five or six days. Um, and so the RZ trial, if you look at their protocol, calls for lowering PEEPs to a certain level before FIO2. And they, they do that to maintain <coughs> peak pressures as low as possible. But as long as you're out of the danger range for peak pressures, let the peak be as high as you want, get the FIO2 down. And so the RZ trial is outdated. It, 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 in my opinion, it shouldn't be used anymore. I don't think anyone uses it anymore. Yeah, to be I started going away, honestly, 10, 10 years ago. Yeah, no one uses it. So yeah. the reason why we see this still have it is a mystery to me. Um, and remember, and I didn't put it in here, but there has been subsequent studies within the last four years or so that shows that a different delta P, not the delta P I said before, but the delta P between peak pressure and uh, peak, the lower that number, the better the patient does. So if you're not on APRV, let's say, and you're on a PRVC mode or something, and your peak pressure is 30, and your peak on a volume control mode is 10, okay, so that's 20, the delta P. Patients do better and have a better mortality if that was the lower that number is. Um, so why would you want to get the people away then? Right? So if you're on a volume control mode, keep the peep high, get that FO2 down. And they're going to be safe. They're going to ventilate between, if the peep is 20 and the peak pressure is 30, then your vent delta P is 10 and they're ventilating between the lower inflection point, the upper inflection point, between 10 and 20. They're perfectly safe. So there's no reason to get that peak down. There's no reason to you know, we're running a little short on time. Can you talk about uh, maybe some contraindications or you know, caution you see here the yes. especially in trauma patients? So, um, so number one, hemodynamics, um, more than anything. <clears throat> when you increase your transpleural pressures um, with APRV giving you high, whatever it's 30 or whatever you choose for the P-high, for a prolonged time, right, so you're going to decrease your venous return uh, to the right heart. You can drop your cardiac output that way. And so, you know, I mean, the protocols that were described here is you should be hemodynamically normal. Listen, if you're hemodynamically abnormal and you're not oxygenating, you're going to die. So in a trauma patient, that, that, you know, you have to choose kidneys or lungs, choose brain or lungs, it doesn't matter. Without lungs, you're dead. So um, that always has been a relative contraindication to hemodynamics. Um, as far as uh, the other trial with ARDS that, that, that said that there is a uh, mortality benefit possibly with paralysis within the first... Uh, within the first 24 hours of ARDS or about 48 hours of ARDS. If you paralyze the patient, they're going to be better. Well, you can't use APRB if they're paralyzed because then they're going to retain too much CO2 and permissive hypercapnia goes out the window when the CO2 is 100. Um, uh, other than that, um, I mean, I guess... What about TBI? You know, we've never, we've never made it a contraindication for TBI. If their ICPs are not tolerating it, ICPs don't tolerate low oxygen tensions either. Now, we don't have the Lycox here. Do you still, do you still no, have that? No, we have one way a long time. Too. So the Lycox is a brain tissue oxygenation probe that will tell you the temperature of brain tissue in the penundrum of a wound or a hematoma or something, uh, as well as the oxygen tension. And so um, we were always able to do things as, as long as the brain had an adequate oxygenation. Um, so now we, we don't have that. But it's not a contribution. Here. They, they saying, probably do, yeah, but still it's fine. Yeah. It, 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 I don't think it's available for all. Um, but we used to use that quite frequently. Here's that. How often do you follow with ABGs? Uh, sparingly. So once someone's stable, meaning I'm I'm at a certain level, I'm not titrating anymore, I, I in my own mind, I always get daily ABGs. Because okay. so I want to see how they're... Because your, your vent might not change, <clears throat> and your sap might not change, um, but then I can see what the PF ratio is doing. When you're actively right, because hold on. And the reason why is because if their SAT's 100%, right, so I can't tell how someone's doing with a SAT of 100% without, even if I look at the ventilator. So with an FIO2 of 40 and a P high of whatever it is, and a T, you know, the settings, whatever they are, if the SAT's 100, 
they, their PF ratio might be much better than I expect, right? Or it could be not that great with the SAT of 100. Does that make sense? Uh, so if the SAT's 90 and I see the vent, that's one thing. I can tell 90% with what I'm doing. But if it's 100, um, I could be doing a lot better than I think. So that's why I want to see the PF ratio. And that will enable me to help me be better. I have one question that's like a, maybe a little bit unrelated to this, but... Then don't ask me. Well, <laughs> it's really to ventilators. Um, how come when, if we're trialing somebody to extubate them, um, thank you, how come we don't do an ABG before we extubate to see where we they are? We do sometimes. But we, I've ne never, I've not so, once, in two years, not once. So if someone has central sleep apnea, we talked about that the other day, if someone is, right, because you can't have obstructive sleep apnea when you have an endotracheal tube or a trachea. Right. right. So it's either a central sleep apnea or... Um, or uh, whatever ventilation defect, COPD, whatever it is, uh, those are the patients that you might want to get a gas on to see if they're retaining uh, on two hours of pressure support. Because for the most, for a normal patient, I say normal relatively, but like we said yesterday on rounds, if someone is a, you know, brain injuries, whatever, but they're able to become tachypnic when they're elevating their PCO2, then you should see that on the CPAP trial. Right. Um, and so if you were burned once, meaning you extubated someone because they passed the two-hour CPAP, they had a leak of the cuff, and then they failed for hypercarbic respiratory failure, and they get re-intubated, you might want to check the gas before you, before you do that. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a thoughtful vent motive. That's why I like it. It's not a set it and forget it. And the people that ultimately, I was told, don't do well on it, uh, probably weren't appropriately managed on it. Right, so um, I didn't put it up here, but sometimes if you put someone on it, it can take hours, hours, maybe up to 24 hours, to get full optimized recruitment from it. And so once you start it, they might desaturate. They might desaturate and go to the 80s, but as long as they're okay, leave them alone. Leave them alone, and you'll see. Give them an hour or two out, you'll see. They'll start to come up, and they'll start to now recruit better. Right, they'll open up those those uh, pores of cone and the Lembert's can canals and all those things that we talked about, and they'll start to recruit that segment. Just give them time. But the point being, it also needs to be aggressively managed to check. It's not something you can set and walk away. Oh, no. Yeah, no. So, so they never set it and forget it. But, but then you might adjust, right? If they're very hypoxic, you might take that T low and make it really small. Mm -hmm. um, you might make the PI exceptionally high. You might make the T high exceptionally high. So uh, all at the same time while increasing your FIO2 as well as yeah. necessary. How would we adjust sedation on these type of patients then? Okay. If Can't you, be comfortable, yeah. But don't snow. It's, yes. They may, you may see an APRV where they will appear uncomfortable because they're doing that pant, so through that plateau of the, of the P high. So, and that's okay. So you actually want to see that because it's, it's the, as, as we alluded to before, the mode works better when, when they're, when they're panting at that, so at that plateau. So if they're completely snowed, it's not, you're not giving them extra benefit out of using the mode, that mode of ventilation. Right, and that's why one of the ways to increase ventilation is to decrease sedation. Mm. And then they'll pant more. And then <laughs> you, know, you can do it yourself. That's APRV, mm -hmm. right? And if you just time it, you can do a four second hold at T high, right? Pant. <laughs> that's what it is. And it's, so it's not the most comfortable vent mode no. at all. No. Um, but it's not that it's uncomfortable, it's, it's the patients, it's not comfortable because they don't know what they're doing. So, you know, to keep them comfortable, keep them with the RAS of zero, just doing anything. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Teichner.